Thank you, Brother McVeigh. Uh, just real quick before we get into it, uh, this Saturday, uh, outreach will be rescheduled because uh, there's the uh, tabernacle that is set up over at Cincy. Sister Ethel has got uh, reservations for the church. And I believe if uh, you're interested in going that to be over at the Cincy, no later than 1115, I believe it was. So uh, I'm, look, I'm going to be going to that. So outreach will be rescheduled. So looks like it'll be a, uh, a good time, very informative. And it's a life-size or to scale model, everything the way it was in the tabernacle. So if you could, I'm my iPad here is kind of going a little haywire on me, but we'll get through it. Not really sure what's going on there, but nonetheless, we'll get through it. So if you could turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. be starting at verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, They were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 38, then Peter said unto them, repent. You can be seated. I'm not going to go past Peter's response, which was to repent. We're all familiar, more than likely we should be familiar with the setting. Peter and the rest of the disciples, along with many other believers, have just experienced the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Jesus had told them to wait in Jerusalem until they be endued with power from on high. They obeyed the Lord and came together in the upper room. And in this upper room for I believe it was 10 days they got into a into a prayer meeting. They were seeking God. They were seeking this promise. They didn't they didn't go anywhere, but they came together because they were believing and waiting for the promise that Jesus had told them about and they said, "You know what? Jesus has given us some instruction." Jesus has told us something to do. He said to go wait on me. Go wait on me in in, in Jerusalem and I'm going to come back to you. And so they didn't get caught up with the worry about their jobs. They didn't worry about maybe the school, the school homework. We're all getting back into that. Those of us that have students, busy time of year and it seems to be just chaos. And then, but you know what? They weren't worried about what the everyday life affairs. They said, you know what? There's something, God's coming back and I want to go meet him and he's going to be back. And so they gathered together and they got in one mind and one accord and they got into an old-fashioned prayer meeting. And there they were filled with the Holy Ghost. We all know how the story goes. They said they started pouring out into the streets. They started asking what was going on. But Peter got up and started to preach about the prophecy of Joel and then went on to preach Jesus. Peter laid out the foundation about the prophecy of the the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, and then he preached Jesus to them. If we ever need something preached to a world that's in dying, that's that's dying and in a world of hurt, we need Jesus. We need to preach Jesus and Him crucified. Then the people that were gathered together hearing the preaching, they got an earful when Peter told them, that same Jesus whom you have crucified, Not only did he 
preach Jesus, but he preached a convicting message. He didn't preach a message of come on and feel good. God's going to take care of you. God's going to fulfill all your needs, all your desires, everything that you ever wanted in life. He said, he preached Jesus and said, Jesus, whom you just nailed to the cross. This same group of people were the same group of people just days earlier, or not so many days earlier, but weeks earlier, were saying crucify him. And now here he is saying, you crucified him. He didn't let it. He didn't hold anything back. He didn't care about their feelings, about how he might offend them. He just got down to where the rubber meets the road and said, this Jesus whom you have crucified. But you know what? Those many people, they could have got offended and they could have, they could have just said, you know what? I, I don't like hearing what this man has to say. He's not tickling my ears. He's trying to, to point out my sin. He's pointing out the things that I didn't think anyone else saw me in the crowd. But evidently, this man saw me in the crowd in those where they were just driving the nails almost as if they were into his hands and feet. But you know what? They didn't. The Bible says they were pricked in their heart. Conviction cut right to the very core. The people felt sorrow for their mistake. Then they go on to ask Peter, what shall we do? When the, when the preaching and the convicting preaching came forward, and then the pricking of the heart, or the conviction came upon these people, they didn't shovel the conviction over their shoulder and say, oh no, He's not talking to me. He's talking to someone else. He's talking to you. The conviction came, and it came inside their heart so much like, what do we need to do to make this right, Peter? What, what do we need to do to, to get ourselves right for our sin? He didn't get you know, Notice what Peter didn't say. He didn't first say, well, you need to get baptized. You need to get filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, he did say that. But his first words to him, then Peter said, repent. I love Acts 2.38. In my mind, and I believe a lot of y'all would agree, probably one of the most important scriptures in the Bible. But that one word, we can't have, we can't have an infilling of the Holy Ghost. If we're baptized, we're just getting wet. If we first have not come to a place of repentance, we have to die to ourselves. I have to die to myself. There has to be a death. When conviction comes upon a sinner, when conviction, when the preaching of the word comes and you're pricked in your heart, you can shovel it over your shoulder. You can brush it aside. You can get up and you can walk out the door but there needs to be something going on that says God what do I need to do to make it right I feel I'm guilty of the sin that, that the preacher man is preaching about I'm caught red handed not only am I caught I'm not I'm not feel bad for being caught I feel bad for doing it. I feel bad I'm pricked in my heart no one else may know what it is no one else may know the story but there's when conviction comes we got to repent we can't get around repentance repent Repent every day. It's not just an option. It's a necessity. If we want to see heaven, there has got to be an altar of repentance in each and every one of our lives. There's nobody that is exempt in this place. If I refuse to repent, I'm choosing to go to a devil's hell. I can choose to not repent or I can choose to find my way down to an old-fashioned altar and get myself right and say, God, I'm sorry. Not only am I sorry, but I'm changing my mind. I'm not going to keep on doing what I've been doing. I'm, it's not just asking God to forgive you and keep on and keep on and keep on. It's saying, God, I need help, but I'm making a conscious decision. I'm making a choice. I'm turning around and I'm going a different direction. It's not just coming down to an altar and shedding a few tears and telling God you're sorry. It's you making a decision and a choice to stop sinning. Asking God to forgive you only gets you so far. I love Acts 2.38. But, but we need some old-fashioned repentance. We need the Holy Ghost. But what good is the Holy Ghost if we can't repent? What good is baptism if they're not repentant? We all know what repentance means. It's a change of direction or an about face. For the sinner to be born again, they must first repent. We can't bypass the altar of repentance. There has to be the death of the old man. 
We want the sinners to come as they are, but we want them to leave changed. The church world will tell you to come on in as you are and just show back up next Sunday morning and keep living with your girlfriend, living with your boyfriend. That they will tell you, it's like, just keep on coming and keep on smoking your cigarettes, keep on drinking your booze, keep on popping your pills, shooting the needles, keep on lying on your taxes, keep on lying on your timesheet, keep on doing what you want to do, keep on lying, keep on sinning. It's okay. We're living under the age of grace. We're living in a different era. We're living in a different time. But the Bible emphatically declares we must repent. Repentance is a precious gift from God that will cause us to have joy in our life. It will cause us to have peace in our life. And sometimes people mistake the gift of repentance for salvation. Because they don't know. We have a lot of people that it it amazes me, the people I run into, and they'll say, what's apostolic? Or they don't even know how to say it. They don't know what apostolic is. And we have a church world even in a world of sinners. They don't know what repentance is. They don't know about getting the Holy Ghost. We have some that you never know who's going to be in our services or who we're going to sit down with in a Bible study. And they have no idea. And they're loaded down with this guilt and this shame. And they make their way, whether it's in the Bible study or whether it's in their car, in the shower, or down here at an altar, wherever it is, they, they repent of their sins. And they feel this burden lift. They feel this, this darkness that just seems to lift off of them. And then sometimes they think, I'm saved. Because they've never experienced. Because you know why? Because repentance is a gift also, just like the gift of the Holy Ghost. And when God gives gifts, He gives good gifts. Repentance is a good gift. Sometimes we think of repentance as being a, a dirty, oh, oh, it takes care of the dirt. Repentance isn't dirty. Repentance is a gift from God, and God gives good gifts. And that's why people mistake repentance for salvation. But Sir, ma'am, it's not good enough just to repent. But I'm not even going to go beyond that. Until we repent, we can't go any further. We must first repent and take care of the dirt that's in our life. God begins to bless us when we begin our journey with Him. He wants good things for us. Why wouldn't He? Because we are forsaking our old life for a new life. We're forsaking our old nature for Him. Why would God not reward someone who says, God, I'm not, I'm not going the way I want you? God is going to reward us. God, the gift of salvation is a great thing, but the gift of repentance is the gift that keeps on giving. It's a gift that, you know what, we, once, that's that first gift, and then once we open up that gift of repentance, there's so many more blessings that ride along right beside it. And they ride along right with their penance and they're yoked up arm in arm. Repentance being a very, very, very important, necessary aspect in our lives. John the Baptist began preaching and declaring to repent. Jesus began to preach and declare to repent. Peter declared to repent. So today, on Thursday night, I declare Repent. Repentance isn't just for the sinner that has never been in the church. Repentance isn't just for the drug addict. Repentance isn't just for the adulterer. Repentance isn't just for the child molester, the liar, the cheat, and the thief. The rep- repentance is for the church today. Repentance is... is we need a revival of repentance in the Apostolic Bible Church. Repentance is something that we need every day in our life. We must live a repentant life. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 31 stated that he died daily, or he died to himself. He said, you know what, I'm going to lay this nasty carnal flesh on the altar of repentance. Because, you know, well, well, I didn't sin today. Well, good for you. You still need to repent. If you work out in the world, there's probably some stuff that you heard. If you went into a gas station, there's probably some stuff that you've seen. If you went anywhere in the world, it's summertime. If you drove down the street, 
there's probably a good chance. You may not have sinned, but you know what? Repentance, if, if you don't need a, if you have no need of repentance, you should repent anyway because we all need to practice. It needs to be more than just an optional thing and something I do every once in a while. It needs to be a lifestyle. Peter said, I die daily. You know what? If we had a lot more repentance, we wouldn't have to have preaching like we had Sunday night. I can dance. You know why? Because I ain't tied down to that garbage. If we were living a repentant life, we would have a lot more liberty in the house of God. Instead of Thursday night thinking it's going to be a, a mundane thing, we would have blowout revival services on Thursday night if we had a lot more repentant going on around here. Jesus told the church, Jesus told the church at Ephesus, well, I've been born again. I spoke in tongues. I've been baptized in Jesus' name. Jesus told the church at Ephesus, you need to repent lest I remove your candlestick. Whew. Well, Jesus say some soft fairy tale that I thought he was with his long hair and his soft skin. Jesus said to the church, to the church, repent. He told the church at Pergamos to repent. He told five of the churches to repent. And I believe he would tell the Apostolic Bible Church tonight, we need an altar of repentance, and it's Thursday night's a good night to repent. I don't know about you, but I want some lo- I want some liberty in this house. I want to see more things up on the wall. I want to see more souls. I want to see more Bible studies. I want to see more young men rising up in the ministry. Hello? I want to see some young women rising up to fulfill the call God has had in their life. But we need to, as adults, we need as mamas, we need as daddies, we need as grandmas and grandpas. We first need to set the example and get down on our knees and find an altar of repentance. I must repent. I must repent. Not an option. Not an option. You may not like it, but you need to repent anyway. Even with all the good things that these churches did, they were involved in a lot of good things. Well, Apostolic Bible Church, you're involved in the prison ministry. You're involved with, you're doing things with the youth. You all teach Bible studies, but I got somewhat against you. You need to repent. I don't need to spell it out because that ain't my job. It was spelled out Sunday night. That wasn't peeling out. That was the brakes trying to lock up, but that's okay. You can repent. You can repent. If you haven't found a place to repent since Sunday night, tonight's the night that you need to make it right. Tonight's the night that it needs to get right. I'm tired of having an ordinary church. I'm ready for the doors to be kicked open and the Holy Ghost to pour out. If you want it, then it's time. It's time to repent. 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 Jesus said, repent. 2 Corinthians says, for godly sorrow works repentance. Not because the pastor came down your row, but because you feel bad about it. Oh, it's okay. It's about to get raw here in a minute, honey. Oh, yeah. It's that godly sorrow that works repentance. It's when that pricking of the heart works. Not because, oh, man. Oh, man, they done found me out. They done bust open the books and they done found me out. No, it's because the preaching of the word came forth. Well, there's the 50%. Where's the other 50 at? Come on now. It's time to repent tonight. We can have an old-fashioned move of the Holy Ghost, but we got to repent. But you know what? You can't repent if you don't get convicted. How are you going to repent over something if you don't get pricked in the heart? Well, I don't feel bad about this, that. Look. If you ain't got conviction about not paying your tithes, then you can't repent. Oh, man. There's got to be conviction in the house. We need conviction. We need a renewing of conviction when sinners come into the church. That the the church isn't trying to repent because they took care of it Thursday night. 
that when the sinners come in on Sunday morning, the church has already taken care of their business. They made everything all right on Thursday night. When Sunday morning come around, maybe there'll be another. Maybe there'll be a wheelchair up there. Maybe there'll be a set of sunglasses because God opened somebody's blind eyes because there was a church that lived the life of repentance, dying daily. Come on now. That's right. God is going to do something. 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 God's doing something right now in this service tonight. I'm telling you, if you want a healing, I'm telling you right now, if you want a healing, you better repent because God will heal your body in repentance. How many times did there was somebody sick that came to Jesus and he healed them, but he also said, thy sins be forgiven thee. You can't have forgiveness of sin without a life of, without some repentance somewhere. It's time to repent. If you need a healing, it's time to repent. If you need a financial miracle in your life, it's time to repent. Repentance brings restoration. Because the prodigal son, he left his father's house. And the Bible says when he came to himself, he recognized, I'm, I'm, I'm all messed up. I should have made my way back. He went back and fell at his father's feet and said, and just repented. You know what? He was restored. The father didn't say, you know what? You go over here, and we're going to work with you for about five or six months, and then we're going to see where you're really at before you can come back home. No. He just clothed them, and they began to party because there was restoration, because there was somebody that came home. Repentance will bring restoration. Do you need restoration back to the body? Have you been cut off for some reason or have you severed yourself? Repent tonight and be restored to the body. Let there be a healing, not only in your physical body, but in that spiritual body. Let restoration start to take place. Let God start to do a mighty work in your life. Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. They, 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 repent. They're turning a different direction. Humble yourself. Pray. Seek his face. Turn around. Go the different direction. Repent. What happens then? Then I'm going to plug my ears so I don't hear them anymore. Then I'm going to just kill them and wipe them off the face of the earth. No, he says, then, once they repented, once you repent, then God's ears are opened up to your prayer. You want to know why your prayers aren't being answered? Maybe you're not repented. You want to know why maybe some things aren't unfolded in your life the way that you'd want them to unfold? Maybe we haven't repented. Why we ain't seeing more crutches and things on the wall. Maybe we haven't, maybe I, I, I'll take the hot spot off you. Maybe I haven't repented. Not only is he going to hear your prayer, but he's going to forgive that sin. And then what does he say? The Bible says he's going to do. He'll heal. He's going to heal their land. He's going to heal how they make their money. Because they lived off the land. They were farmers. They were like, he's going to, oh, when you repent, God's going to bless your business. When you repent, God's going to give you blessings. Now, I'm going to look around the room and nonchalantly, uh, and somebody gave a testimony to me Tuesday. Nod your head if you're okay with me sharing this. There was somebody that came to us Tuesday, Pastor, and you may know this already. And they said, I got a praise report. I didn't know what was going on. I was like, well, well that's the praise report. And they said, you know what? I went down to the altar Sunday night. I repented. Who all was here Sunday night? You heard the message. She, he or she, rep <laughs> well, the cat's out of the bag. She repented, repented. 
I remember watching, it was probably one of the first ones, didn't worry about because nobody else was coming up, was one of the first ones in the altar and repented, turned around, had a change of mind, went into work on Monday, got a $4.25 raise. And for those of y'all sitting back in the seat and didn't come repent, there went your blessing right out the window. Don't tell me God doesn't bless. That's why it's a gift of repentance. We need the Holy Ghost, but we need repentance. We need a revival. You want a blessing in your life, sir, ma'am, boy, girl? Then you need to find a place of repentance tonight. Tonight, repent tonight. You need blessing in your business. Repent tonight. It ain't going to get any prettier. I'm just going to preach repentance, repentance, repentance. If the New Testament was, came into existence preaching repentance, we're going to go out of this world preaching repentance. We need it. I need it. You need it. Nobody's exempt. God sent Jonah to Nineveh. This is for my girls right here. God sent Jonah to Nineveh to declare that he was going to destroy in 40 days. The people didn't get mad at Jonah. They didn't cast him out of the city. You know what they did? Well, there's one. That's because I paid her before we came in. So what did the Nineveh do? And you know what? God pulled his judgment back. Repentance brings mercy. You want mercy in your life? You facing a trial in your life? You facing some dilemmas in your life? Have you tried the altar of repentance? God may decide to pull back the hand of the devourer off your life where it seems like Satan has come in and tore everything up from your marriage to your finances to everything, to your job, to your car, to your home, to your house, to the food, to everything you eat. But you know what? Pray and repent and God will pull that off of your life. God brings mercy. It does not matter what stage of life we are in. It does not matter if we're the rankest sinner in the house tonight. It does not matter if our sin is not as big as our neighbors. The declaration tonight is the same as it was when John the Baptist declared it, to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If none of these other things were true, if there wasn't a blessing in repentance, if there wasn't healing in repentance, if there wasn't mercy in repentance, the most important reason for repentance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's coming back, y'all. He's coming back. How crazy is it when you hear the radio come on your phone, the news, wherever you get your news? We know how crazy it is. But if all the, the blessings weren't enough for you to repent, just know it's going to keep you out of hell. It's going to keep you out of hell. Now, I don't want that to be the only reason that I repent. It's just I'm, I'm, the only reason I'm going to go down there is I don't want to go to hell. And if that's the only reason that you can find your way to an altar, that is awesome. It's not awesome. That's good that you're making your way to an altar. But if nothing else, it's because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If he was to come back tonight, how many times have we heard that? Praise. If he was to come back tonight, if the Lord was to come back tonight, just ponder the thought. What if I would have just went down to the altar? What if I just would have just laid it all out and not worried about what anyone thought about me? Psalms 51, Nathan the prophet has just had a little conversation, a little scenario with David. And Thou art the man, David. You're the man that's living in sin. David didn't run away. David didn't run to the hills and to declare that Nathan was, was a false prophet, that this wasn't for him. But David found a place of repentance. And I'll read Psalms 51. 
Brother Brian, if you could make your way to the uh, uh, piano tonight, and you could stand. Have mercy upon me, O loving, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desireth truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part. Thou shalt make me to know wisdom. This is the prayer of a man that has just been caught in adultery. And he's praying a repentant prayer. Not just a, I'm sorry, God, would you forgive me? But he's trying to get a hold of the throne of God. He's trying to get a hold of the mercies of God. Not just a simple, God, I have sinned, forgive me. I believe that we can say a simple prayer as that, and God will forgive us. But remember, forgiveness and repentance, repentance are not the same thing. Repentance is David making up in his mind that I'm not going to do it again. Forgiveness is being forgiven of that because he repented. They're separate. We can be forgiven, but we still must repent. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. God, take this old heart, this old sinful, dirty heart out of my life. And replace it with a clean, washed heart. Cast me not away from thy presence. David was concerned about the fallout from his sin. It wasn't a casual encounter at the altar of repentance. He was genuinely concerned about being cast away from the presence of God. I believe that we would have a lot more repenting if we believed that our actions would be met with being cast away from the presence of God. We have had a relationship with cheap grace. Our sin will take us to hell unless we repent. Our sin will drag our families to hell unless we repent. David was genuinely concerned about never, ever coming into the presence of the Almighty God. If we would get concerned about our destiny if we don't make it right. If we would just get concerned where we're taking our kids if we don't make it right. And take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors their way, thy ways. And sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God. Thou God of my salvation and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness O Lord open up my lips and my mouth shall show forth thy praise when God forgives you for your repentance you're going to sing about it you're going to have a song in your heart and the joy of thy salvation is going to come in like a flood for thou desirest not sacrifice else would I give it Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God. Thou wilt not despise. 
Do good and thy good pleasure unto Zion. Bid thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness. With burnt offering, with whole burnt offering, then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Because the altar is the place of repentance. What would God do Who would God bring Where would God take us What kind of blessing would he bestow upon us we would just find an altar of repentance. You may say, well, I don't have anything to repent of. <clears throat> then where are the intercessors? Where are the ones that are praying for the ones that need to repent? Where are my brothers and my sisters praying maybe for me because I haven't repented? If we really cared a lot less about what people thought and about what God thought, these altars would already be full. But everybody's waiting on everybody else or worried about what Somebody's going to think. When it comes to heaven and hell, I don't really care what you think. When it comes to my salvation, I can't worry about what Brother Tristan thinks about me making my way to an altar. When I have sin in my life or whether I don't have sin in my life, when conviction comes, I need to find an old-fashioned apostolic altar and pray till I talk in tongues. There needs to be more repenting in the house. What would God do if we would allow ourselves to be broken at the altar of repentance?
God for mercy. Thank God for a fresh touch tonight. Hallelujah. Oh, can we worship the Lord right now? Can we thank the Lord for his touch? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, he can reach. He can reach. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's the blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose its power. Thank you, Jesus.
Thank you, Brother Bates, amen, for preaching the word of the Lord tonight, amen. It's so true, amen. If we want anything from the Lord, amen. I, I was listening to Brother Billy Cole just a few days ago, amen, and he was talking about.